it's quite exciting to have the voice of God just, just <laughs> speaking uh, to you. Who was that and where was it? <laughs> so when were you there last? Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted uh, to be here at the uh, Milken Institute uh, Conference in uh, Singapore for the Asia Summit. Uh, I'm also uh, even more delighted to have uh, uh, this esteemed uh, panel uh, here today. Uh, on my far right, um, we have uh, David Bonderman, who is the chairman and founding partner of TPG, Texas Pacific Group. Um, in the middle, um, to my right, we have Bino Chaudhry, who's the chairman of uh, CG Corp uh, Global. Uh, and finally, to my immediate right, uh, Arif uh, Nakvi, who is the uh, founder and group chief executive of the Abraj Group. Uh, these gentlemen uh, probably need no further introduction than that, and so I won't give it. Uh, they're well known, uh, they're well known to, to all of you. Um, the topic today is dispelling the myth of, uh, of emerging markets. And I wanted to start by just giving uh, a few facts and figures um, to set the tone for, for our, our discussion today. Emerging markets uh, today are contributing 60% of global GDP growth. And in fact, uh, this is expected to continue uh, into, uh, into the future. A decade ago, they contributed about 50% of GDP growth. And in spite of uh, some return of growth to developed markets, uh, the emerging markets, given the strength and size of the denominator, uh, even though growth has slowed um, in, uh, uh, in absolute terms, given the size of the denominator, they're contributing more to global GDP uh, than they ever have uh, in the past. 85% of the world's population lives in emerging markets. Uh, 414 cities in emerging markets will fuel neither, uh, nearly half of the growth in global GDP uh, through 2025. And by the way, 293 of those 414 cities are in Asia. Um, by 2025, it's expected that almost half of the world's billion dollar plus companies will be headquartered in emerging markets. So these are incredible statistics. They are facts. These are not expectations. These are, by and large, facts today. Uh, yet, uh, at BlackRock, uh, we went out and recently survey surveyed uh, about 50 of our largest uh, pension and sovereign wealth clients. And we asked them about their asset allocation. And I want you to listen carefully to these statistics, gentlemen. Only about half of those clients had any equities allocation to emerging markets at all. And for those that did have an allocation, the average allocation was only 5%. Uh, if you were to look at uh, emerging market debt, uh, the numbers are even more stark. Only a third of our clients, of our large institutional clients, uh, had any allocation to emerging market debt. And those that did only had 3% of their portfolios. Uh, in, uh, in EM debt. It must so, be really nice to have uninformed clients. <laughs> we're trying to inform them. That's why we're all here. But there's a stark divide between the facts of where global growth is and the reality of where uh, even some of the world's more sophisticated investors are putting their capital to work. So gentlemen, how do we, for, uh, for investors, for others, how do we dispel the myths uh, of, uh, of emerging markets? That's, that's what we want to spend our time on for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, but let me just start by asking, uh, I'll start with, with you, David. Um, how do you define emerging markets? Is there even a definition? Is, there, is that the right definition? Yeah, TPG I'll... has been involved for a long time, and, and you're an expert. Well, uh, we have been in so-called emerging markets since 94 when we started the firm and opened our second office in Shanghai. But there's no standard name or denomination. It's a question of how you look at it. Um, people have coined the term emerging markets. Now there's to talk about frontier markets, which are even more emerging than the emerging markets, or maybe less emerging than the emerging markets. Um, 
So I think once you get beyond the OECD, you're in emerging market territory. And it sort of depends on how you look at the particular risk set. Um, we can talk about that at, at, at some length. But the risk set is different in emerging markets. They tend not to have good judicial and legal systems. They tend to have political instability, at least compared, we, we used to think that, compared to, say, the United States. Now we think it's the other way around, of course. You know, how do you well, uh, think, of, think of I the definition? Well, I come from uh, Nepal, and, and I've almost spent all my life investing in emerging market, our own group's capital. So this little bit cuts us apart from the two giants who are sitting here of the private equity world. I mean, I, I completely agree with David that you can't generalize. We've seen markets like Sri Lanka, you know, which at times when nobody wanted to touch today, you know, probably one of the fastest growing economy in uh, South Asia. I mean, set of rules that you apply in each of these countries, which are by definition called the frontiers or the emerging markets, can be so different, I think. So, I mean, I, there is another set of definition that gives to be give, needs to be given the markets which are highly challenging politically. For, for instance, I like to give the example of my own country, you know, 25 governments in 26 years, but still business to be done. We've grown big time. The country is poised for a all time high uh, GDP growth, capital flows in. So I think one has to be careful when making a random sort of a judgment about a sector in a market, in a country, and the country itself. I mean, I'll, I'll say, and maybe I'll, I'll pose this in the form of a statement that you can then comment on, uh, Arif, but you know, in my view, the term emerging markets itself, in many respects, is a flawed term. <laughs> yes. I mean, it really, it, I mean, anybody who spent time in Shanghai recently, I mean, it, I think it emerged uh, a few years ago. Um, uh, comparatively, uh, comparatively speaking, even to almost any city, any city in the world. Correct. Um, and so, you know, really, maybe the better term is growth markets as Thank opposed you. to as opposed to 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 emerging markets. Is is that the right way of looking at it? I think it's spot on. And you know, for the last decade, we haven't been referring to our markets as emerging markets. We call them global growth markets. And your introduction and all the statistics that you were talking about actually addresses that fact as well. These are the global growth markets. This is where two thirds of the world's growth is gonna come from. And this is where opportunity is maximized. People live there, consumer markets are growing and booming. And in my opinion, it's almost, call it part laziness, call it part patronizing, to call them emerging markets. Because when you look at China, as David said and you echoed, the reality is China has emerged. China is, if not the largest economy in the world, shortly about to become one. And Binod talked about being politically challenged. Well, the biggest political challenges, and I know we're not gonna talk about politics on this panel, but the biggest political challenges are the person that the US elected as president, huh. or Brexit, right? So there are challenges that are out there, not necessarily in here. These markets are about growth, they're about opportunity, they're about being able to invest in opportunities which are fairly interesting as well on a global basis. But the reality is that the growth that everybody agrees that these markets are uh, exhibiting and translating that into investable opportunities is where arguably sometimes the disconnect occurs. And from our perspective, we've come up with a fairly convenient way of breaking down these markets. First of all, you know, personally I hate acronym investing. I hate the idea of N10 or BRICS or whatever. I remember asking Jim O'Neill the question when BRICS came out saying, what do Brazil and Russia have in common with India and China? And his response was absolutely nothing, but it sells. So the reality is that when you look at where opportunity sits, you can break these markets down into three buckets. We really should and must look at China on its own. China is without question something that merits its own attention, as does the United States, as does Europe. And it is going through its own 
um, redirection, if you like. It started off as an infrastructure-oriented, investment-led opportunity moving into consumption. And now they've got Belt Road, which is a fantastic export of their thinking around infrastructure and investment. And then you have the commodity producing economies, which are around 40, 45 around the world. And these are fairly volatile. They're linked to one commodity. Their currency should be the US dollar. And because of their reliance on a commodity, generally speaking, their governance systems are weak as well. But the real opportunity in our markets is the cons consumer oriented economies. Again, about 40, 50 of them. This is where tomorrow's investment flows are going to go. This is where growth happens. And this is where actually a lot of the companies that you talked about, uh, which are the world's big consumer companies, people like Nestle, Colgate, Palmolive, Kimberly Clark, Unilever, Coca-Cola, you name it. If you disaggregate the earnings statements, they're all public companies, anyone can do it. Two thirds of their growth, and I'm generalizing, and 75% of their profits come from these markets. And it hasn't just happened organically, it's happened through M&A activity. And that's but, where the opportunity is. I might add, Mark, it's really very idiosyncratic. I mean, Nigeria, which is going to be the world's fourth largest country, is an emerging market. You can argue whether it will ever emerge. On the other hand, South Sudan is an emerging market. It's never going anywhere, at least in the time frame of the humans in this particular ballroom. Uh, on, on the other hand, Indonesia is an emerging market. So is Cambodia. Those are great places to invest. So it's all about the particular place. And uh, I agree with Arif that this is where the growth is coming, but it isn't coming uniformly. It's coming from some places and not from others. And you have to look at the markets individually. You might love some particular market. Um, we like Indonesia, for example. Um, it's got its challenges, but it's a great country growing rapidly. On the other hand, so is Nigeria but you have to count your fingers if you get anywhere near it. And even then, maybe you got your ankles too. <laughs> so, so David, let me ask, let me ask you this question. Um, so, so you bring that up, that obviously these markets are idiosyncratic. I, I actually think an allocation to emerging markets, quote unquote, is, is nonsensical. Um, if you think about people have an allocation uh, typically to, uh, to Europe, they have an allocation to the US, there's a lot more in common between those two markets than there is between Nigeria, uh, and, uh, and India, let alone, uh, uh, let alone Russia and China. Um, but um, how risky are these types of markets to invest in? Are, they, are, are we ascribing too much risk to them? Are we ascribing too little risk to them? As you think about um, the portfolio and the types of investments that um, uh, TPG makes, how do you assess placing a, a risk premium on, on these markets? Well, you have to look at, as we said before, markets idiosyncratically. I mean, there's all kinds of different risks that are associated. You know, as Americans, we tend to think of the U.S. as not having political risk. I think, as Arif pointed out, that appears to have been a mistake in the last election. <laughs> um, but you've got to look at the, the, the markets as for what they are. I mean, some emerging market countries, to use that term, are have their currencies pegged to the US dollar. As a dollar investor, you look at that very differently than some country with kyat or bat or some other strange religion as their currency. You know, it makes a big difference in the risk assessment. You've got to look at the political system. It's not so strange when you make a lot of money in that currency. That yeah, can work out nicely. It can work out <laughs> not so nicely. Too. I have a, I have a, a hundred trillion dollar note from uh, yeah, from, I've from, got one in my Zimbabwe. 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 Did I give it to you? I think you gave it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've got one as well. Yeah. <laughs> they cost three cents. If that, if that. When issued, they were three dollars. So it just depends. Some places have pretty decent legal systems. Some places have reasonably decent governance. Some places are terrible. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't invest there. We we invested in Myanmar uh, when it was under the rule of the generals because we thought with the risks were going to go in the right direction. And we, we were able to buy a distillery. Everybody wants to drink in Myanmar now more than ever. <laughs> Worked out all right. Somebody else, we, we bought a distillery business in Turkey. That worked out even better, much to my surprise. So it just depends on the risks you're going to take. You go to the Middle East and you're going to buy a distillery, you've got a different kind of risk than you're buying a distillery in Ireland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me, maybe, uh, maybe, 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 it's, maybe it's more of a growth market. But since. Yes. Yeah. 
Can I, can I just add one thing? Since you, since you talked about risk, I think it's equally important to just disaggregate that risk to start with, right? And very often, as David pointed out, currency is an issue. Yes, currency is an issue. But we tend to forget that with the preponderance of the US dollar, often it is not the weakness of that local currency, it's the strength of the US dollar. And this year, everybody's very excited that EM is on the rebound because the currencies are performing well. Well, quite frankly, it's the US dollar which is performing badly, which is a large determinant of that trade as well. So I think we need to sit and think about the way risk plays out in each of these markets, the local nuances. So if, and you know, I'm sure everybody in this audience is an experienced investor and really knows what, uh, how to disaggregate that risk, but it is very important to start with that you don't paint the whole landscape with one brush. It is very important to start with disaggregating as I was attempting to do into three buckets and then equally important to disaggregate the risk down to individual country level and to focus on the fact that you know, these markets are all at different stages of development, focus on the ones where opportunity is maximized, where governance systems are getting better, are not there yet, but are improving, where currency is either stable or can be mitigated. But the most important risk of all that you operate in in emerging markets, without question, is counterparty risk. Because this is the single determinant of whether you will make money or not. Who are you partnering with? Where are you putting your money? And do you have sufficiently credible partners to help you on your investment journey. So local knowledge is probably the most important element of anything that you can figure out when you're looking at these markets. Bino, do you want to comment here? Yeah, I some wanted to places, add... Some uh, of the places you operate are, are, are actually, uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call them frontier markets, but they're certainly uh, not necessarily, uh, all the markets in which you operate aren't necessarily sort of the traditional emerging markets where investors would first go, for example. Right. Yeah. The first point I want to make that even in China and India, there are parts of the country which is still highly challenging. Let's talk about Yunnan, for instance, okay, in China. You would not apply the same set of rules. You would not apply the same set of structures. Okay? The local environment is completely different to Shanghai or Beijing. India, same thing. The Northeast, the Seven Sisters, it's, it's one part of... India, which continues to be in insurgencies over the last 70 years. If, if you ask me about politics, and I think all of us are saying that nobody can make any, should not try and make hasty conclusions about politics. Politics can change, and they will continue to change. I think what is relevant is to understand the intrinsic demand of the environment, the country. It's going to grow. What is going to grow, irrespective of politics, I gave the example of my own country and Sri Lanka. Okay, and then how do you structure the partnerships? I think being too legal doesn't always work. My experience has been, okay? Including in the United States, by the way. Okay? It's, 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 all, it's all about finding, and I completely agree with Arif, the finding the right set of people that you work with in the local space, including partners and the people who Mitigating, you know, the probable uh, eventualities, into ranging from the currency risk to others, and basically taking a longer-term view that these countries have to come back. Okay, and I've seen in my own lifetime that uh, you know it may have taken a couple of years here and there, more or less, but it has happened. And when they come back, they come back big time. And that's where your dividend is. I think in many respects, I believe that that's also a huge comparative advantage for investors like us. That gives an entry barrier to you know, those who think differently in terms of a highly sophisticated investment mechanism. For instance, data statistics may not be uh, reliable that you access. You've got to make decisions based on your gut feel many times. So I think it's a, we are talking about a completely different rule of the game, so to speak. I'm not saying that everything is crazy, you know. <laughs> there are predictabilities. But uh, to a large extent, it's understanding the market, working, and then being prepared for all eventualities. So it's also the case that emerging markets 
frontier markets tend to be story economies, which is they're either in favor or they're out of favor. So-and-so gets elected and all of a sudden Rwanda's in favor and everybody loves Rwanda. Uh, there's a civil war going on that works, it doesn't work. Everybody hates Sri Lanka, as uh, Binod pointed out. We took a look and said, well, you know what? There's no capital, no capital, zero. Nobody's made an investment. No private equity person made an investment in Sri Lanka in 15 years. So we took a look and it looked like the government was stable to us, notwithstanding the history of the place. So we bought a hospital, we bought a bank, two things that um, swelling economies will help, and they've both done great. And there wasn't anybody competing. You tend to do better when people don't compete. I think the, the point that you're making, David, is that if you go through the nuances of what makes a good investment decision in a particular market, it is going to make sense whether that economy is under stress or not. I remember we invested in a dairy business in Turkey, and I was being interviewed on a separate subject and on CNN, and when you're on live TV, you don't have yeah, to now, watch Now we, we actually know the difference in your investment techniques and David's. Which are? You, you invest in milk and yogurt, and he invests in booze. <laughs> <laughs> Easy to see which one wins in that case. <laughs> I, I, I was pretty sober this morning. <laughs> what, what about this afternoon? <laughs> so I was, I was talking about the example of this company in, in Turkey, and the, and the person who was interviewing me said, why would you invest into Turkey at a time when everyone is out in the streets with, uh, against Mr. Erdogan? And my response was that the Turks are going to drink milk irrespective of who governs them. And that actually happens to be a reality, because if you invest in defensive sectors where the opportunity is great, you talked about Nigeria, and last year, when everybody was running away from Nigeria, we put a lot of money, $250 million, into a fertilizer business in Nigeria. And actually, it was the most perfect hedge against currency depreciation, because not only was our partner a fantastic partner, but 80% of our exports were in US dollar denomination, and the majority, 90% of our expenses were in local currency. So it works when you think through the investment hypothesis, and, and, and you've got a long-term visibility on your investment. David, how do you think about getting scale in these markets? I mean, that's one of the challenges for, for, for many investors because the amount of work that it takes, um, having feet on the ground, finding the right partners, uh, finding ways to mitigate some of the inherent risks, um, but it's hard to get scale. How, how, how does how well, do scale about that? Scale can be important, but maybe not necessarily so, depending on your capital base. I mean, we have a series of capital bases some of which are designed to make small investments in difficult places uh, on the theory that we've so far been able to generate higher returns from that strategy. And, um, and so sometimes you can't, simply can't get scale in, because the markets are too small. But as Arif pointed out, a place like Nigeria, whatever else you can say for it, it has scale. Um, a place like Indonesia, whatever else you can say for it, it has scale. So there are some markets that are scalable and there are those that are not. And if you don't have the right pool of capital, you can't play. In some cases, as I say, the right pool of capital is a small one. So let me ask a bit of a, a tough question, Binod. I'm going to uh, ask it to you just based on your earlier comments. Um, you talked about the fact I'm interested in, in the other panelists' um, views on this as well. You talked um, a little bit about the fact that you do have to do, uh, pursue business in a, in, a, in a slightly different way. Um, you do have to find the right, uh, the right local partners. You may not be able to uh, rely on traditional legal channels, for example, in, in some of these markets. Um, that does raise, uh, raise a question uh, about, uh, about corruption. Uh, it does raise a question uh, about uh, things like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, et cetera. How do you mitigate against that risk, and is it possible to do business in some of these uh, in some of these environments, um, and still play by, let's call it westernized westernized rules. You know the good news is that in most of these countries that we are talking about, I mean there is a realization at the political level, whoever uh, may be in power, whichever party may be in power, and the systems, the different institutional mechanism, you know which support investment, which promote investment, that they need to be seen as being investment friendly. You know, this is the good news. I mean, you go to any country, you know, you, f you find them craving for foreign investment. So if you position yourself as a credible, transparent organization, okay, and, and, and maintain uh, 
that uh, kind of a, um, identity and image, and yet you have your own mechanism to deal with some of the uh, you know, necessary evils, so to speak, in terms of dealing with uh, the expectations, you can do it. I think, so that's where the local talent or local knowledge or local expertise, whether you create of your own or you partner with someone comes in. So I'm sorry, Vinod, but I'm gonna have to emphatically disagree with you. <laughs> and, and, and why I'll disagree with you is because, yes, there is corruption in these markets, Mark. And corruption exists in every market around the world in different forms. The key is, as a disciplined investor, you've got to be able to say there are things that you will do and there are things that you will not do. And if you're very focused on what you will not do, I call that in very loose terms a corporate foreign policy. When you go and you're investing across markets, every institution that invests across markets must have a very clear sense of culture, of its own identity, and what it stands for and what it doesn't. And if, when you go into a market, you make it crystal clear that whether or not you're a US firm or a Chinese firm or an Asian firm, you will not indulge in foreign corrupt, you will not do anything that counters the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. You will not adhere to or accept principles that are not part of the legal norm. And then you go down the route of looking for businesses. You're not investing in the government. You're not investing in the country across the board. You're buying into certain businesses. And when you buy into those businesses, you have to make sure that the business you're buying into has the same value system as you. And private equity is actually a, um, a great unwrapper of the identity of businesses. So you can actually unwrap the business during due diligence and figure out whether you want to do it or you walk away. And because of that, I think that what we have been able to instill, and TPG is a prime example of that, we are in so many other firms of, of quality that operate in these markets, we know what we stand for and we know what we won't do. And as a result of that, what we're actually doing without saying it is we're also bringing good practice into our markets. And that, I think, is one of the most important things we do. Because not only are we engaged in making money for our investors, we're also in engaged in a developing a stakeholder culture and an environment of inclusiveness, which enables our investments to succeed. I remember during Arab Spring, we had nine companies in Egypt. They happened to be in defensive sectors, as you said, hospitals, education, supermarkets, and so on. And our businesses grew through that five-year period at an average of 27% a year. And we weren't targeted because we were known as people that were supportive of local industry, local business, and local opportunity. So it's also how you position yourself that when the bad times come or the bad guys come calling, you will find that your defensive ecosystem is pretty strong. David, you wanna? Arif, due respects to you, let me pull an example. A joint venture of Singtel and Tata's could not get an airline flying in India 10 years ago at a time when Bangalore or Karnataka was seen as one, one of the most forward-looking state and politics. It's not, it doesn't have to be money-changing hand. As you mentioned very correctly, and I agree with you that there is different forms of uh, expectations, different forms of corruptions all over the world. They may be relationship-based, they may be favors of a different, if anybody say, tells me that in emerging market, whether you are a, a world's biggest uh, multinational of any short or private equity, you do not indulge in favor taking and favor giving, I disagree. So the reality, I have to, now this is getting fun. Uh, <laughs> so I can't it's making, comment. It's making my job much easier. <laughs> <laughs> I can't comment on Singtel and Tata, but I can comment about our experiences. And I know this is not meant to be a session where we I know, talk I mean, about us, our own organizations. But look, we invested in a utility company in Karachi in Pakistan eight years ago. It is a country not known for transparency. It is a country where in government you are often asked for either favors or money or whatever. We went into that organization knowing that if you could have designed, if you'd employed all the consultants in the world to design a broken company, you wouldn't have done a better job. It hadn't made profits in 28 years. It was a utility providing electricity to 20 million people. And yet we went in because quite frankly, we bought it in at a value where 
transmission, distribution, generation, it had the works. It was a monopoly. And we were buying it for the price of the, of the generating assets. We went in and we did everything by the book to the extent that business school case studies around the world have been written about it. We avoided every single point where you would have had to come into contact with government, even though you were a utility, and have to pay someone something. And because we stood for doing the right thing, civil society rallied around us. And what we did is we turned a company that hadn't made a profit in 28 years into today where it's making $500 million a year, and we sold it to Shanghai Electric for a significantly large enough number that made our investors happy. You can do these things. It just is a matter of how you want to position yourself. So I, I, I so let me let me let me no, let me no, let me let, let, let me <laughs> the one one let, little point I wish to make, Mark. Then I will come know, back. It happened. It happened because it is Arif, not me. Okay, the governments, the people he was dealing with, they don't have to make a deal on a deal specific basis. They know that Arif is there, and you know, in time. No, that's too it, simplistic. It's right? a difference. So what is it? Yeah, that, We're talking it's about. It's called bloody mindedness. It's about yeah. doing the thing but the I right agree way. That so, 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 so what's clear is there's a degree of complexity yes. uh, in, 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 in investing. Pollyanna has joined the panel <laughs> because both of what these guys said is wrong, really. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it would be fun. Corruption, like everything else, is idiosyncratic. There's corruption everywhere. Correct. That's what and it's the question is how you handle it. Uh, American firms are advantaged in a perverse sort of way by the FCPA because sophisticated people all over the globe know Americans cannot. They risk jail for doing this. If you're German, you don't risk jail, you just get a tax deduction. So <laughs> if you can pay bribes, you'll be asked for them. If, you, if they know you can't pay bribes, you don't get asked so often. Not, it's not you get never asked. We've done business in 102 countries, and the most corrupt place we've ever been is Greece. It's the only country where we actually had to withdraw from the market because you could not do business without paying bribes. This is, we had a company that made parts for humans, knees and shoulders and what have you. It turns out doctors are all government payrollees, and you can't sell your product without bribing each doctor individually. And uh, the non-US companies did that, and the US companies withdrew from the market. You have those kinds of things. You have to be careful. Uh, you have to try to get it right. And there's a difference between being a European citizen and American citizen is how these laws are applied. So you, you've got to be careful. Um, but you never get it right entirely. And every now and again, you'll discover that one guy in the company somewhere paid somebody something. Um, and you'll see how it works. Um, the interesting, most interesting example of that is going to be the US attorney's investigation of Uber to, to see if opening up in some 90 countries in two, three years they managed to do it without paying anybody anything. And so far, it appears that they haven't paid anybody anything. So people really wanted that service, and they got it. David, it gives me great pleasure to tell you that you actually agreed with me. <laughs> so, 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 that was so a let mistake. Me, so let me, <laughs> let, let me use that as a, as a, as a segue. I mean, we, we clearly see the complexities. We clearly see um, the fact that uh, individual markets, even individual cities, individual states, are, are idiosyncratic um, and, and, and difficult. And difficult, but but let's turn to the positive side just for a second. Let's talk about 85 percent uh, of the global population. Let's talk about uh, the burgeoning uh, middle class. Let's talk for a minute about uh, the consumer. Um, how is it that you're thinking about attaching yourself uh, and your funds to that growing middle class? to the consumer demand that is, by and large, driving many of the economies um, that we're, 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 we're talking about. And, and David, it has to be more than booze. So, yeah, so there are some sectors that everybody is in favor of. Every human being on the planet wants more and better health care, and they're willing to pay more for it, whether it's $6 a year in Bangladesh or $14,000 a year in the US, it's the same. So you take advantage of this sector. You invest in hospitals. You invest in uh, generics. You invest in different systems that help correlate these things. Uh, um, you look at uh, other businesses. For example, the impact of the internet on retail businesses. Look what's happened in payment systems, um, all led by emerging market countries. Uh, so there's plenty of opportunity. Um, 
you just have to be a little bit thoughtful about it. I mean, it was, it was a very short time ago that when most people thought about emerging markets, they tended to think about actually the real value being in either uh, low cost manufacturing or in the natural resource sector. I mean, that's, if we were on this panel 25 years ago or probably even 10 years ago, um, there'd at least be some discussion uh, about that. Is the, real, uh, is the real resource the people themselves today and the market? Is that, is that the resource that we should be thinking about as investors? 100%, not even, not even 99, 100%. And you know, to me, the real reality is, and since you asked the question where, where we invest, is in those countries which are consumption-led, where the opportunity is coming from the emerging middle-class consumer. Okay, and where the significance of the marketplace is dictated by the fact that these consumers, whether they're in the lower middle class or the upper middle class, are acquiring purchasing power. Second is that these populations are young. The average age in these countries is 26. The average age in the OECD countries is 40. When you're 40, what do you do? I don't know, I'm not 40 yet, but if I was, <laughs> I'd be thinking about savings, I'd be thinking about spectacles, and I'd be thinking about healthcare. When you're 26, you want to spend more on just about everything. You want to borrow, you want to consume. And then the point that you made earlier about the cities which are driving consumption, so many of the people in emerging markets live inside cities. And as you pointed out, the growth, 413 cities which are going to drive global growth, half of global growth over the next two decades. That statistic came from McKinsey, and I know you're very close to Dominic Barton, but if you were close to BCG, it would be 430 cities, but they both agreed, fortunately, on that range. And the most interesting fact is, it's a statistic I came across recently, there have been in the last five years, uh, $470 billion that have been deployed in these markets across 2,300 transactions, 85% of which have been in four sectors, which are industrials, materials, and logistics, healthcare and education, financial services, and consumer goods and services. Now, if you take these four, it goes back to the same defensive element and the same factor on consumption. And, you know, there are a million young people in India every single month that turn 18. These are people that want to quality of life, they want jobs, they want to consume, and they want a better standard of living. They don't care who is ruling the United States. They don't care what the businesses outside are doing. They are focused on their immediacy, on the immediacy of their economic opportunity. And I think that in itself, these youthful populations and the fact that consumption is growing is the single biggest opportunity for investment, for private equity, and for growth orientation so, in these so, markets. So but let, me, let me ask a, a, a sort of a follow-on question, and, and anybody can, can jump in on this. It, it used to be, as we thought about this topic, um, that you know, the way to win was take a Western business model and apply it um, to one of these growth markets and, and that was a sure way to make money. But the reality is that we're actually seeing that flipped on its head today. Right? The reality is today that the traditional business models in many cases are antiquated. They're not using technology in the same way. David, you talked about payments. We can talk about, uh, we can talk about what we've seen in sort of the, uh, the leap to, to mobile communications. Uh, we can talk about uh, entertainment, uh, we can talk about retail, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so in fact, it's not so easy anymore. It's not just saying, well, you've got a movie theater business uh, in, in North America, you should just build movie theaters in, in, in China because um, people aren't watching movies, they're w watching things in a, in a very, very different way or um, through, a different, uh, through a different channel. So. In some senses, um, that makes it more difficult, I, I would think, because you not only have to think about the market, but you also have to think about the fact that these markets are, in some ways, because of where they're coming from, much more affected by disruption and, and technological innovation. Well, they, these markets have, in some cases, a kind of perverse advantage, which is the Western countries spend zillions of dollars building out infrastructure of all sorts, which turns out to be antiquated. And it's no accident that, let's say, the payments things that we're talking about was really pioneered in Kenya, where they had no infrastructure. They didn't have poles, they didn't have wires, they didn't have a landline company resisting deregulation. And they've been the leader in payment systems, Kenya of all places. Um, you see this over and over and over again. Because you're going from 1G to 4G. Yeah, no, absolutely right. 
uh, um, you see this, but not just in payment systems. You see it in the banking business. You see it in all kinds of businesses, in the retail businesses. There, there weren't supermarkets all over rural Kenya, but there are uh, the ability to order your groceries over the phone. So all of these things have been adapted in, in emerging markets, frontier markets, third world kinds of countries because they don't have the infrastructure and they go right ahead. And we're going to see much more of that. And there's lots of opportunity for Western capital to invest in those kinds of circumstances. Mina, do you want to comment? Well, uh, yeah, let me give you a simple example, like a business that we are in, instant noodle, OK? We produce a brand called YY, which has close to about 3% of the world market today. And we sell in more than 40 countries. We are in countries which has the highest consumption, more than 40 packets per capita a year. We are in countries like India, where the culture is just beginning to start, where it's not even four. And we are in countries, now we're going to uh, the Balkan, Serbia, a part of the world where there is no culture of noodle eating. But what is common is, given the features, the unique selling points of the product, it has to come back. It's a question of working with the market. It's a question of no matter what politics, no matter what has been the, what is the food habit, you, 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 you sort of customize. It's a well-tested concept that we are trying to apply to all these different parts of the world, and it has to win. So what I'm trying to say that either, it's not purely about a Western business model as such. It's about understanding well-tested products and services which have not been tried out in emerging markets. I find so many markets where, till date, the retail is going through a very, very primitive stage. Let's talk, talk about 7-Eleven uh, type of uh, outlets. You know, there are many of, of uh, probably the 20 countries which are defined as emerging market. In 10, they don't exist. And it's, it has to happen. There has to be a sort of a transformation of the mom and pop show, uh, shops to these markets. So you can pick up so many different well-tested ideas, customize it to the local needs, so long the demand exists there, and the capacity, buying capacity is improving, and you're sure to win. I think it's a great question, because I think the, the beauty of technology and the disruption that is happening in the digital space, actually it's almost tailor-made for emerging markets. Because what you achieve through technology disruption, and Uber showed it, and Airbnb showed it, and you know, every single investment of TPG has shown it that they've put in that segment, um, the reality is that these um, ideas get scale very, very quickly. And in markets where you just said 85% of the world's population lives, they have the ability to do good and to make a leap forward in, in um, consumption patterns and in opportunity that much easier. So provocatively, if I can leave a thought with everyone in this room, and you know, everybody in this room, doesn't matter where you're from or which um, social, so, social strata you belong to, 80% of your household income as individuals is spent on four segments, the same four segments we talked about earlier, which are healthcare, education, food, and housing. And if 80% of your income is spent on that, and technology is disrupting those four sectors more than any other sector, then imagine the fact that if 5% enhancement is made in um, reducing the cost by which these services are available to us, that's 5% more that is released into the global economy into this mass of 85% of the world's population, which is going to go into either saving or consumption. And that is only a positive step forward. So I'm actually very optimistic about these markets. I'm optimistic about the opportunity presented by these markets. And I'm also optimistic about the fact that the reform process that these markets are following is extremely exciting. I'll give you Latin America as an example, Mark, where if you take the Pacific Alliance countries, which are Peru, Colombia, Chile, and Mexico, in aggregate, they add up to Brazil, but they don't have the issues of Brazil. They have a highly educated workforce. They have a rule of law. It is easier to enforce a contract in Colombia than it is in the UK, and that's a fact. Right? So these are very interesting developments that are happening across these markets. And that means that if you invest sensibly, sagely, and with the right counterparty, you will do well. Okay. 
I'm going to open it up. I think I'm supposed to open it up for, um, for questions from the floor. Henny, you're not allowed to ask any. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Henny. Um, Thank you, Henny and Mark. <laughs> um, um, while we're getting the mics uh, to be able to, to ask questions, I'm, I'm going to ask what's going to be my final question. I'm going to give you guys time to think about it. We talked about the low penetration by institutional investors into emerging markets in their allocation. So I want to ask my final question to each of you when we're done asking from the floor is very quickly, what advice would you give to an institutional investor who today has uh, zero or very little allocation to emerging markets. How should they get it? Should they get it? That's the question that we're going to come back to at the end. Mm. Uh, in the back of the room over here. Uh, two, two questions. Uh, uh, as, as a family office investing in these very volatile emerging markets, I was always curious to understand from a fund perspective, what's the r risk premium you you add to a 10-year lock for illiquidity in a fund? And two, if you look at these markets like Brazil, um, the, the old private equity model of locking up your capital it may be arcane or may not work because when you may enter the wrong time and you probably exit the wrong time and you end up sitting there for three, four years till the currency comes back or the new regime uh, replaces the, for a better regime. So if you can share with us those two. So, so two questions, a liquidity risk uh, premium and, and second uh, lockups. RF, do you wanna? So look, a liquidity risk premium, in my opinion, is again going back to being a bit of a myth. The, there is always a bit of a premium attached to being locked up long term, and that doesn't really, should not be any different whether you're in developed markets or in emerging markets. The, the way in which you enforce your understanding around risk and the way you look, look through it, I think should determine what premium you're willing to pay. And I go back to the point that when there was a global financial crisis, it didn't happen in Indonesia or in Nigeria or Singapore. It happened from the heart of Wall Street. It happened at Lehman Brothers. And when you had disruption through the world's political systems and a enormous shutdown in investment confidence, investor confidence, it was because of Brexit or uh, elections in certain Western countries. So you have to balance both and come up with the reality check that, you know, uh, if you're going to put money into a certain market for a long enough period, you will make money, but you will make money as if you were making it in any other market. Anybody else want to comment on this? Uh, yeah, I would just say with that mindset, you shouldn't invest in these countries. Um, <laughs> if your view is you're going to invest at the wrong time when the market's high and you're going to sell out when the market is low, but you lose, lose your money, money. it's probably not a great sound investment strategy. Uh, which is why, for example, you never want to invest in Brazil when the currency is rotund. You want to invest in Brazil when things aren't working and the prices are cheap. Um, and that's true in, the, in life generally. Which is quite the opposite from actually what we see in terms of hot money in these markets often yeah. flowing in and out, particularly, particularly in... in, uh, in that's why, as we said before, these are story economies. People rush into economies because something wonderful has happened in Brazil. I don't know what that would be in the case of Brazil, but something wonderful. <laughs> so I won't, I won't ask you to comment on the Argentine 100-year bond that was just issued at, at 8%. If you could count on defaults three times in the 100 years at least. <laughs> yep. Go ahead. I'll repeat the question. So the question was, um, uh, first of all, the, 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 uh, the woman is a, is a, a columnist for Mint, which is a, a financial uh, newspaper in India. And uh, the question was, uh, in India, what do you see essentially as um, the positives and, and negatives uh, from recent policy changes? You know, so where I, do you start? OK. <laughs> Modi, number one, no question about it. I think uh, he's given a great sense of uh, comfort and uh, hope to the whole world. Uh, I think the 
speed pace at which reforms are taking place, including taxation, GST, you know, uh, um, I, I think uh, there is a whole lot of, you know, I can go on and on under, the, under your Make in India uh, mission. Uh, I, think, I think India is moving at a pace where it's clearly giving a signal that if you don't ride, if you don't take a ride plunge now, you're going to be missed out. Okay. Third is I think huge uh, efforts and investments are going into infrastructure. Okay. The whole uh, idea of transforming the railway system okay, and making them not only much more functional but also commercializing, commercializing it. I think these are some of the distinctly uh, visible elements of the new regime which has put India on a fast track develop, uh, developed country. Problems, I think the politics is getting too centered around Modi and BJP. I think uh, India has a history of uh, being ruled as a coalition, you know, regional parties have always played important role. And then uh, at the moment, uh, uh, you know, the way things are taking place, uh, you know, the, uh, the, I don't know how many of you realize the race for carrying forward the RSS's agenda of Hindutva, where will that lead India to? You know, that's a major issue that is beginning to play up. Forget about the, in the minds of the people outside, but people within India. So India is advantaged in a few ways from what's happened in the last cycle here, uh, particularly as compared to China. For, first of all, uh, India is a hydrocarbon importer. And the fall of oil and gas and energy prices generally have been very much in India's favor. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is India never did much business with China. So when China slowed down and impacted the Indonesias and the Philippines of the world, it didn't impact India very much. And, and third, as Pinod said, they got Modi elected, who, uh, who, who appears to be you know, a, a semi-reasonable politician, although, as Pinod also said, tending towards uh, populism and nationalism. And you could see very difficult relations between the Hindu and Muslim communities as a result of BHP's policies, which whatever else Congress did, and they did a lot wrong, they didn't play on that particularly. So that's a, that's a, that's a problem. The other problem about India is India. And what, what I mean by that is <laughs> you have this weird culture of castes uh, and social status being fixed in lots of ways, uh, which is a difficult kind, kind of regime. Um, and Modi can do something about it, but so far he's doing the wrong things. Uh, finally, the country and the world generally have been suffering from Modi euphoria. And what I mean is he's so much better than his predecessors that people tend to overlook that some of the things, no matter God herself couldn't fix. I mean, from the time the British left India in 1948, they didn't put a paintbrush to any building in the country for 65 years. They didn't build a single road, a single railroad. They didn't fix the airport, et cetera, et cetera. And Modi can get, by decree, he can get the ministers to stop playing golf on Monday morning and to show up at the office. But he can't cause the, the trains to exist where there's no tracks. Uh, and being it's a democracy, it's harder to get things done. If you look at the, him, the airports in Delhi and Mumbai, for example, which are vastly overloaded, uh, they've got squatters at the end of the runway and they can't pick them out because they all vote. Uh, and there's pluses to that, but there's minuses. So India is a very complex, complicated place. It's not a bad place to do business necessarily, but it is complex. When did you go to India last, Toby? Oh, I go there uh, a few times every year. Okay. No, uh, I've got a little clock here. It's counting down. Uh, so I'm going to come back, unfortunately, to my, I get to, as the moderator, ask the last question. I've already told you what it is. Uh, you each have 30 seconds to answer the question. What is the advice if you want to dispel the myth of emerging markets? And if we've done uh, part of the job of doing that today in the panel, what advice would you give? Uh, we'll start with you, Arif. What advice would you give to those investors who are either under allocated or not allocated at all? For a starting point, stop looking at 
these markets, I know what you do in the West is different, but for these markets, look at the asset class of equity and stop differentiating between public equity and private equity. Allocate more into private equity, it's a self-seeking statement, uh, but the reality is that public markets in these markets, across these markets, do not represent the real economy. And the people that have got burnt in the past have often happened in the public markets, and it has been because of these hot flows that you've been talking about, Mark. And the real issue there in the public markets, if you take away India and China and Russia, and you look at all of the rest, all of them together are less than the top five US stocks taken collectively. And each of these markets individually, you have 10 stocks that dominate 60% of the sector, and they're not the sectors that are driving economic growth. So start looking at the longer term trends and opportunities, invest into the consumer opportunity, and take a view that the markets in which capital is being deployed will take time to come back, but it'll be very profitable. Do you know? I think uh, they need to come out of the box. They need to be flexible. They need to be much more entrepreneurial. They need to put together a system, whether with partners or on their own, which is far more agile, far more you know, adaptable to the fast-changing environment. And it will be a mistake for them not to take the plunge in a serious way now, because these countries are unstoppable. David, final word. Regrettably, I find myself agreeing with Arif. <laughs> and I counted those six times. So the, uh, the issue about liquidity and public markets is exactly the right one to focus on. Because in most of these uh, so-called emerging or frontier markets, the markets are illusory. They may have a stock exchange someplace. It's got six stocks that make up the whole market. You go to Brazil, there's five countries that make up a majority of the, of the value of the, of the Bovespa. Um, and so since you're really not getting liquidity, you don't want to pay for it. And that's why Arif is totally right. Whatever you think of private equity, generally, it makes much more sense in these emerging markets because you need the extra tools that having ownership lets you have. And you're not going to get out until the cycle is right or you're big enough to list in New York or London or Hong Kong. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.